Let's switch to our panel here. We had a bit of a change of the schedule. Uh, so one of the speakers, Celine Rammstein, was uh, supposed to speak uh, in our earlier panel, but, but it was in the middle of the night in the United States. So, so uh, we moved Celine to right now, and hopefully we can uh, hear uh, from her. Hello, Celine, do you hear me? Yeah, very well. Oh, that, that's great. Uh, so what time is it? You're, you're in Washington? Yeah, I'm in Washington. It's 9.17 a.m. now. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, uh, sorry for waking you up in the middle of the night. It probably uh, <laughs> happened like that. So, good. Okay. Well, in any okay. case, um, uh, um, Celine is a Carbon Pricing Intelligence Program Coordinator uh, at the World Bank Group. And uh, she will talk to us about the... Uh, uh, she will give us a preview of the state and trends of carbon pricing in, uh, in uh, 2017. So, Celine, we hear you perfectly, and the floor is yours for, uh, for about uh, up to 15 minutes, okay? Thank you. Okay, perfect. Well, first, let me thank you so much for your interest in this presentation and for being accommodating with the uh, U.S. time difference. I'm really grateful to be speaking at 9 a.m. and not 5 a.m., so thank you for this. And indeed, I will present really briefly some of the key facts that we will be part of a report, the State and Trends of Carbon Pricing 2017, that we are actually publishing in a couple of days. So you really get being almost the first one to, to hear this. So. I'm really excited to be presenting you these facts. Uh, so really briefly, just to make sure we're all on the same page, as I'm not sure, importantly, what was covered before, uh, I want to highlight that in this report and in my presentation, we refer to carbon pricing as all of the policy tools that really put a price on carbon which is to say put a price on the pollution, on what is bad and what has a lot of effect on health, pollution, etc in order to decrease it, in order for all of the negative externalities to be internalized through a price to influence decisions for companies and for government. And more specifically, we look at carbon taxes and we look at emission trading scheme of what is often referred to as carbon markets. So this being said, uh, we're seeing a lot of momentum and a lot of interest, or maybe in EU at least we should say renewed interest, because EU has been leading on carbon pricing for a long time in the past years. Part of that is related to the carbon, uh, to the Paris uh, Agreement and to the climate pledges, uh, the so-called NDCs for those who follow the negotiation and were in the room, that the countries uh, submitted ahead of the Paris Agreement. So these are basically short documents where they present how they intend to uh, meet the two degrees target at the, at the country level, to, to keep it really simple. And out of all the countries who uh, published uh, such a uh, climate commitment, 81 of them, uh, when they describe which policies they will use to meet their targets, uh, refer to carbon pricing policies. Some are really specific and say they will do, for example, a domestic carbon tax, others just say that they intend to use international carbon market. But this clearly gives us a sense of the interest there is around this topic uh, in the negotiation. Uh, again, in the negotiations right now, in, uh, we are a couple of days uh, ahead of COP23 that will be held in Bonn, and there is one of the article of the Paris Agreement, that's Article 6, that refer more specifically uh, to the issues related to international carbon market and to potential exchange of mitigation outcome or uh, carbon emissions, if you want. Uh, again, I'm oversimplifying here, so if there are a negotiator in the room, they might want to, to clarify that further if you have time later in the day. Uh, and also just to say that this interest should materialize in the couple of days by implementation of more policies and by uh, progress in the negotiation. We should be able to see that in a couple of weeks at COP23 in Bonn, but also at the Paris Climate Summit in December. And then uh, in the next year, I will, uh, as I will present right now, we should hear about a lot more new carbon pricing initiatives being implemented in many countries. So where are we now? There are 47 carbon pricing initiatives around the world that are either implemented or that are scheduled for implementation and that are, for example, still sitting with a national parliament but should be implemented in the next years. All of these initiatives taken together cover 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see in the graph on my slide below the uh, increase in the um, overall total GHG emissions around the world covered by these initiatives. And as you can see, the last decade has been really encouraging. Uh, 
And finally, in uh, last year, in 2016, government raised about 22 billion U.S. dollars thanks to these carbon pricing tools. So either with a taxation system, either by selling allowances, for example. So where are those initiatives? You can see it here. There is a color code to say whether it's implemented or scheduled for implementation or just under consideration. And as you can see, it used to be mostly in the developed world, in the northern, western world. But now we really see a lot of activities uh, going on in China, in uh, Asia, and also more and more interest in the Americas and in Latin America. If we look more specifically at what happened in the past two years, which is the period our report is covering, we have eight new initiatives, which is a, a really a record since we start tracking. Uh, we see activities uh, in um, Australia, in British Columbia, in China, uh, in Washington State, Ontario, Alberta, Chile and Colombia. And just next year, we're expecting a new announcement for the Massachusetts carbon uh, market and also for the South African carbon tax, uh, which is like a good news because it will finally hopefully happen next year, but also a bad news because it kept on being delayed and that's why it's still here on my slide where it was actually already, uh, it has already been there for a couple of years. So South Africa is like both a good and bad news, I would say. Uh, now, just a word about companies because um, I understand you also have a lot of private sector representatives in your audience, and it's important to say that the carbon pricing agenda is no longer only a government or subnational government or even city uh, agenda. It's really also a private sector agenda. And we have over uh, 1,300 companies that report to CDP, which is a carbon dis former carbon disclosure project that tracks the, car the internal carbon pricing company uses um, internally. So. It's quite interesting when you look at these data because what it tells you is that companies are increasingly using these tools for different reasons. Very often for 11%, oh, sorry, for half of them, no, sorry, I'm getting off here. For two-thirds of them, they used it as a risk management tool, uh, which is to say either they know or they think a carbon pressing is coming. In 83% uh, of the companies we, that were surveyed, their jurisdiction already have a mandatory carbon uh, pricing tool in place, so it's a way of internalizing it into their, their uh, own operations. Either as a, this risk management tool uh, in prediction of a future risk coming up, or as a way to measure the risk embedded in their assets, uh, there are many reasons to, to use this internal carbon pricing, uh, and we see more and more companies doing it. We saw 11% increase compared to 2016, which is quite significant, and we uh, think that most of it is related to the conclusion of the task force, whom you might have heard about, which is called the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, which really strongly encourage companies in disclosing their emission, disclosing how they use if they use and how they use a carbon pricing tool, and really encouraging all of them uh, to start using and to start having an internal uh, carbon pricing. So now just a word on the what level of prices are we talking about. It's extremely diverse. It ranges from zero or one dollar uh, for the government to around 140 dollars per ton of CO2. You can see all of the governmental or subnational initiatives here, and you can see we even had to zoom in to see the, the one at the very bottom of, uh, of the chart because there are just so many who have a really low price. And at the World Bank, we just released a couple of months ago a report with the high-level uh, commission on carbon prices with Lord Stern and, Nicola, and uh, Joseph Stiglitz to say that if we really want to achieve the Paris Agreement and meet the two degrees target, we need those prices to be higher. We actually need those prices to be more around $80 per ton to $100 per ton in the next decade. So we're really far from this level now. Only 1% of the emissions covered by a carbon pricing instrument by a government are actually at this price. And basically it's like Sweden and I think Switzerland. So we really need to see more effort in this direction. And similarly for companies, their prices are also really different. They range from 0.01 ton per CO2 equivalent to almost 1,000. Um, and CDP and ECOFIS conducted a similar survey to try to see um, in, uh, sorry, in similar study to try to see what would be a price consistent uh, with the Paris Agreement in the power sector, and they indicated it in the graph here 
you can see it should be between 24 uh, and 39 dollars per ton of CO2 uh, by 2020. And you, as you can see here as well, uh, I think it's like more than half of the companies uh, are below uh, this, uh, this, this price range. It's still better than government, but still a really long way to go. And just a couple of words of conclusions. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of progress, and we're expecting a lot of good news in the next years, as I just mentioned. We should see China ETS uh, live hopefully soon. We should see a federal government initiative at the Canada level for the provinces who do not already have a carbon pricing tool in place. Mexico is also starting an ETS simulation. Chile and Colombia are looking uh, also at an ETS uh, uh, following the introduction of their carbon taxes. Kazakhstan should relaunch its ETS after a two-year suspension. And Singapore also uh, is looking at a carbon tax for 2019. All of those good news, of course, uh, do not overshadow the situation in the U.S., where the, at least at the federal government level, uh, action is you know, going back, uh, if not uh, stopping uh, in some instances. But a lot is happening at the state level, so we're, at least we can be realistically optimistic of uh, some actions going on in the U.S. But to get to the level we need to be uh, to meet the Paris Agreement, we really need, uh, as far as carbon pricing is concerned, to expand the coverage of the initiative. Uh, because right now, as I mentioned, 85% of the global GHG emissions are not covered by carbon pricing initiatives. We need to expand the coverage of existing one, and of course, we need to have a lot of new initiatives. We also need to deepen the impact and the price signal these initiatives send to the market by having higher prices and by having a better alignment with other policies because current pricing policies should really work hand in hand with other type of policy. Either it is other taxation, either it is fossil fuel subsidies removal, either it is any other environmental policy in place or, and, or uh, opposite like fossil fuel subsidies type policy in place. And finally, uh, and this is really relevant for the two weeks ahead, we need to see more progress in the negotiations on how to implement Article 6 so that countries have more clarity on what does really carbon pricing at the international level looks like uh, in the, when the Paris Agreement uh, is implemented. So with that, I'll invite you to uh, check the dashboard, which gather all of the data I mentioned uh, on our uh, website. It has been launched a couple of months ago, so it's still quite new, uh, but it, you can really find all the data I just presented in this dashboard. And we have uh, our reports coming up twice a year. One, in May, we have the Carbon Pricing Watch, and now in November, we're having the State and Trends of Carbon Pricing. And I'm not sure we have time for questions now, but please do not hesitate to send me an email if you have any questions or if you want any clarification. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Celine. Uh, I think we'll finish here. Uh, it, it's good um, because we have some signal problems uh, coming through. So if uh, oh, any sorry. questions uh, at all, the, the, there was the email address right there and, and your... Uh, okay. And your story was very uh, detailed in any case. So, well, thank you very much for taking the time and joining well, us today. Well, thanks to you and to the tech team. Okay. They have been really patient with me. <laughs> okay. Have a good day. Good stuff. And a thank good you very much. Thank you Bye. very much. Thank you. Um, so, th the, there was a bit of a problem with the audio, right? It was not that easy to understand. And, uh, but I think the uh, conversation was really relevant uh, because the carbon pricing obviously plays a big role uh, in, in, in everything that we're trying to do internationally and globally with regard to tackling climate change problem. But I, I, I wanted to uh, send our greetings to the interpreters booth over there because they had to translate all of this and it was difficult to hear. So uh, let's bring some energy drinks over there or, or a couple of cups of coffee so to uh, inspire these people who are doing a, a very valuable but difficult job over there. Okay, good. Um, actually, I'm looking forward to, the, uh, to, to this panel overall because uh, it, is, it is devoted to the entrepreneurship uh, part in the story. And, and that is a very important uh, part of the story because obviously it's not just government regulation uh, and you know, what, what is being done on the European level, global level, but a lot of it takes place and, and the uh, sort of uh, contribution in the, um, in the overall objective of uh, tackling climate change lies in our hands as as individuals, as households, but also as commercial companies, as, as businesses. So um, there are many things that can be done. Uh, and um, to get inspired, we have uh, 
uh, four more um, participants in our um, uh, panel here. We have Mart Ramat, uh, who is Energy Advisor to the Ministry of the Environment in Estonia. And Estonia is currently uh, the presi presiding country in the European Union. So Mart is a very, very busy person, uh, as many of you are here today. But he's particularly uh, busy. So thank you very much for coming uh, for coming over. Uh, we have uh, Reynis Berzinch over there, who is chairman of the board of the financial institution Altum uh, uh, in Latvia here. And uh, we will have um, a duet presentation uh, from, uh, from World Wildlife Fund. We will have Milan Koiman through the uh, video link. And I hope, just hope that the sound is going to be, but no, not now, but I just hope, I, I hope already now that the sound is going to be a bit uh, better uh, to, uh, to make this easy uh, to us. Um, and uh, Elin Kolat is uh, a colleague of Milan's uh, who is going to get involved in, in, uh, as well in that conversation. We'll begin with uh, Mart here. Um, so how do you do this? you have a 10 minute uh, about that presentation? Okay, uh, go on and, and let's, let's hear what you have to say and, and then uh, go on from there, please. Uh, hello, everybody. First of all, I must say that I'm very thankful that I can be here because uh, my history has shown me that uh, cooperation between uh, my Baltic neighbors has been as productive as it has been fun. So I'm really looking forward to uh, this event uh, and, uh, and also, uh, also everything else uh, here. I'm Mart Ramat and yes, I'm an energy advisor, but now uh, during our presidency, I'm head on uh, been involved in international climate negotiations, which is very good because my presentation tackles or, or sort of um, touches both sides. It touches energy and it touches uh, as well climate negotiations because uh, um, as uh, uh, as as you uh, correctly mentioned, the, uh, companies and enterprises are really important. Uh, part of tackling this uh, huge uh, global problem. So uh, what we're talking about, I, I will be talking about international climate cooperation and how uh, we as a Estonia, as a state, are uh, trying to have this approach uh, in order that we can help not uh, only the recipient countries, but also as well uh, help our enterprises. So, uh, as uh, maybe maybe to recall, uh, developing countries has uh, have uh, agreed that uh, there will be huge, uh, uh, huge uh, um, climate-related aid to developing countries uh, that amounts to 100 billion billion dollars annually uh, uh, by 2020, and Estonia also takes our small but uh, quite considerable part and we have agreed, pledged to, uh, to, uh, to uh, give de development aid uh, that amounts to 1 million euros annually. And what we have done so far, we have been participating in, re in different programs. So we have been contributing to Clean, Green Climate Fund as well as uh, different uh, projects that has taken place all around the world. Uh, but now we have decided that, um, that this is a very good tool to help our own enterprises, to help our own enterprises who have problems, uh, to help our green tech, clean tech uh, sector, which has problems, uh, uh, let's say, uh, entering new markets, entering uh, uh, or providing solutions, providing know-how to tackle uh, climate change uh, mitigation and, adapt and adaptation. Uh, problems in, in third world countries. So what we are trying to achieve uh, with our, our new approach is to promote Estonian technology solutions and know-how to also to develop in countries because currently we, uh, our clean tech sector has only partners in, in let's say in Europe uh, and in our neighborhood. We don't, our, com our companies does not have capacity to uh, really to go to places where the uh, development uh, help and technologies are really needed. So, so uh, we are trying to now um, enhance, uh, let's say, uh, or, or, or have this kind of uh, uh, institutional framework that we, when we where we could support our companies who are trying to 
provide these solutions to developing uh, countries. Mm, and, uh, and of course, uh, we won't exclude any other forms of, uh, of development aid, but, uh, but we are now trying to enhance this new kind of pro program. And, uh, and we, of course, we don't want to have uh, uh, this kind of solution that yeah, we, we, will, we think that we have a good, uh, good technology and we try to, uh, try to sell it abroad. Of course, uh, we need to re be really aware of uh, uh, development country needs and their technology needs. So there are good, uh, very good, let's say, tools in order to, uh, for, from the UNFCCC, uh, the, it's called the technology need assessment plans, technology action plans, where developing countries are li listed their technology needs, uh, what they need to adapt to climate change as well to mitigate the climate change. So, so uh, really our, let's say the program is really based on the need of developing countries. And our priority recipients uh, or the countries we intend to provide is the, the development aid is least developed countries, small island states, and also, let's say, the priority partners that are highlighted in Estonian, um, let's say, humanitarian aid action plan. Uh, of course, uh, uh, here is a small graph uh, which really shows what are the needs for uh, developing countries, technology needs. Uh, it, uh, and uh, I think the key is here that 90% of countries consider energy and energy production uh, plus transportation to be a priority and of course the key here is electricity production where solar and biomass uh, biogas solutions as well as effective lightning are the technologies the development countries are really need uh, but adaptation has a bit different let's say uh, uh, different needs there the problems are by uh, agriculture and water so the countries are need countries uh, in different areas uh, uh, who are most affected by the climate change are needing uh, just uh, new practices uh, in in these sectors mm. and uh, and to let's say we are trying to have more of a knowledge based not uh, knowledge more knowledge based approach so this is why we conducted the study which was uh, con concluded this uh, autumn where we, uh, where we basically uh, mapped and uh, fi found out, uh, let's say, the keys or, or the, the, the technological, um, the technological, uh, the, the really the technology what Estonian green tech sector can provide. And, uh, and this is why we are trying not to, let's say, this money, the sink the aid into black hole to understand better what uh, what developing countries need, uh, what, uh, what are their opportunities and, and targets there, what, uh, how are the markets, uh, etc. And, 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 and mostly to have a clearer picture about Estonian own clean tech sector, of, about our capacity and our companies and, and their problems. So uh, the core is, uh, the, 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 let's say, the above, uh, uh, the above uh, table shows that Estonia is quite, let's say, bad uh, when it comes to e eco-innovation in the European Union. We are on the 19th place, place of course, a bit higher than Latvia, like uh, in most graphs. <laughs> but, uh, but still, uh, this, is, this shows that we need improvement. And, um, and uh, while we were, let's say, mapping out our clean tech sector, uh, it shows that we have a lot of companies who are mostly dealing with mitigation, who, are, uh, who have mitigation technologies, and only, uh, only a fourth of the clean tech sector deals with adaptation needs. Uh, and let's say the, uh, what, what, was, uh, what was a good find from our study is that, uh, uh, that there, are, there are quite many and, and majority of, of these companies have uh, their own technologies which are ready to be exported into developing, uh, developing countries. Uh, sorry that the, the, the tables are in Estonian, but I hope that I can, I can really show you. This, this, uh, this graph shows that around, this shows uh, 
the technologies that the Estonian companies has have on mitigation and, and uh, over 50% is for energy. So this, what, what this means that we have a clean tech sector uh, which have different energy uh, technologies that could be exported. And also building sector I think is quite, uh, quite relevant here that, uh, that there are solutions and technologies uh, uh, to have a co to uh, to reduce CO2 emission from from building practices, and uh, unfortunately or, or interest, interestingly in our agriculture and forestry, which is we consider Estonia to be a forest country, there are not so much let's say innovations or technology providers in in our in our country. Uh, adaptation to climate change is a bit different. Uh, uh, different, let's say, topic. Uh, mostly, Estonian uh, companies have uh, are able to provide consultation or catastrophe uh, or disaster management uh, solutions to developing countries. And 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 the problem here is as, as well that we are not our companies have not been able to work out the technologies, but they are still providing, let's say, from uh, providing already mature uh, different solutions to. To, to their consumers. Uh, and what we did, we mapped out the potential or the export potential for Estonian mitigation or Estonian clean tech mitigation technologies. And this really shows that uh, uh, on the up there, it really shows that energy production and energy uh, efficiency and uh, energy, uh, energy grid services are the really the let's say the most marketable uh, most mar marketable technologies for Estonian clean tech sector and, um, and and there is a definite need in developing countries for these kind of uh, uh, these kind of uh, technologies uh, adaptation technologies uh, are a bit different uh, and uh, and this graph shows that that we as a Estonian clean tech sector has more potential for, uh, uh, for mitigation than to adaptation technology, which really shows that only uh, the grey dot above there shows that uh, uh, it, uh, how to say, sustainable agriculture is the one, is the one technology or, or one solution that really the development countries need. And we, and our, let's say not, not much, but some of our companies can provide it to the to the developing country partners, uh, our sector plans, and that the problem is that currently our sector doesn't export to these countries, which are really in need of these technologies. Uh, developing countries are undervalued as partners, as export markets, and uh, but um, uh, let's say the needs or the companies uh, feel that uh, if. Estonian institutions can help them find partners, can help them uh, provide uh, or en enter new markets, they are definitely able to increase their production. So, uh, so this, is, this was one uh, thing we took away from, uh, from this study, that if our, uh, new, our climate um, uh, development aid uh, helps to helps our countries to uh, to uh, to enter new markets. Our com our companies are able to provide there with technolo 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 technological solutions. Sorry. And uh, just to wrap up, uh, what were the main points from our study that Estonia Estonia really needs a clean tech uh, sector national strategy we don't have it currently but we do need it because then it helps our our uh, clean tech sector to uh, really have a more clearer vision vision on where to develop and and also as i mentioned uh, it uh, from the developing countries there is definite need for uh, sustainable agricultural practices it also then the the national strategies should be should include these kind of uh, more bioeconomy uh, or organic Estonia vision and uh, again we shouldn't be we should uh, Estonia should concentrate on priority markets 
should uh, find not uh, tens uh, or, or 100 different partners, but let's say five priority markets, developing markets, markets where our companies can provide their, um, their solutions. And also, um, uh, and also uh, there is, fine, of, of course, definite, definitely need uh, from, develop, from our clean tech sector to have financial support uh, to penetrate these developing, uh, develop, developing country markets as well as to, find, to really to help uh, countries to access these markets, to have uh, more solutions or, or, or programs uh, that uh, companies can use to find partners uh, and, uh, and have a more clear vision about, uh, uh, let's say, the target markets. So all in all, uh, I think that, um, that, uh, that this kind of uh, cooperation, global cooperation, global development aid can be, of course, very beneficial uh, more, even more for small and medium-sized enterprises because, because when it's, uh, mm, when, it's um, when there is an institutional framework to support it, then the companies can provide their products and can enter the new developing country markets and, uh, and, uh, uh, and help to fight them against the climate change as well. All right, thank you. Um, could you stay along uh, for a second there? Um, is that something new in the uh, European approach to development aid or? That is, let's say, this is our, our new domestic approach towards, okay. uh, f towards develop development aid. So we, as I first mentioned, we, we of course contributed to other programs, but now we thought that this is, can be a good tool to help our domestic ent entrepreneurship as well. All right. Can you mention any examples, you know, if you could, of any you know, so very specific products, specific technologies that have been, um, you know, whose expert has been encouraged through this uh, mechanism? Uh, this is to be implemented yet. Oh, right. So it's not we, there just, yet. This, we just, uh, this uh, autumn, we just finished it, this oh, right. study on, client, uh, on our, our clean tech sector. So the next step is to implement this project and help our, comp our companies to, uh, to. Can you nevertheless give me the taste of, for example, for, for example which, which could be the potentially the, the biggest seller in this time? We have uh, some companies in our clean tech sector, or one company is quite, uh, uh, quite, let's say, they have quite well-developed uh, uh, fuel cell technologies, which could be then, uh, which currently it uh, exports to Japan, but, but of course it can be also uh, have a market in, in developing countries as well. Fuel so, cell. Fuel cell. Fuel All cell. Right, so, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and <laughs> can you draw me? A, no, I draw me. <laughs> Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for this uh, very useful food of thought for, I don't, I don't know whether there are Latvian, yes, take a seat. Um, I don't know whether Latvian foreign ministry representatives are here, but I, uh, I, I hear there have been ongoing discussions about our development aid policies in any case, so this, this might be an innovative way of how to go about it. Well, thank you very much. Um, let us hear from Reinis Berzinc as well. Uh, on green bonds, as a funding source and stimulus for decarbonization. So uh, a bit of uh, innovative Latvian experience uh, as well. By the way, do you have any graph that shows that we're better than Estonians as well? Or? Uh, yes, I guess we can just say that we have created a program which is not currently implemented in Estonia. <laughs> yeah. okay. Good. Sorry for that, Mart. <laughs> Go on. Competition gets us yeah. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. So my name is Renz Berzinc, I'm the CEO of uh, Altum. It's a company which is owned by the state and basically which deals with the uh, state support for the places where there is a market gap for getting the finance for good projects. Like in Estonia would be Credex, perhaps you know, and in Lithuania, Invega, for those who come from Lithuania, in 
uh, Finland, Finnware, and so other. I guess everywhere in uh, developed Europe there are institutions like we are. So what, what I would like to briefly introduce you with is our newest uh, product, which will deal with uh, financing green investments. And what is more important, I guess, for us, uh, like a state-owned company, the finance is getting for this program uh, comes from the green bond issuing. We are the second state-owned company in Latvia after Latvenergo. I guess everyone knows Latvenergo who have done this uh, thing, who have basically issued bonds very successfully before two weeks. So we are quite proud about that and I will very briefly touch this. So general information, 100% 100, 100, uh, state-owned company. You can see this division about ministries, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Economy and Ministry of Agriculture are shareholders of Altum. So this is like an introduction what we are. So we provide access to finance in those areas which is prioritized by the government. Um, three companies merged together and the Altum was developed. That's the reason why in previous slide you can see this division of those particular three shareholders because those companies uh, were owned by those three ministries before that. Currently, as I said, so we are 100% owned by the state. We are established by the cabinet of ministers and uh, their special law of, uh, about Altum, which is very rare occasion that uh, any state-owned state company has special law. Okay, uh, here you can also see, I guess, the last slide as an introduction about us. Our business model, we are not so small by um, comparing Latvian scope. We have approximately half uh, a billion assets. Uh, you can see in the loans, guarantees, venture capital and other, other services. So um, this was uh, 100, 432, it was like on half of this year, now it's bigger and we will end the year something around 500 in total assets. Okay, and now about today's topic. So what we saw was that there is currently like a status quo about energy efficiency in Latvia is unfortunately also sometimes a lot of good talks about good declarative uh, phrases, but I guess uh, what is the absence of some particular uh, uh, practical instruments how to support those good initiatives. So what we did, we also made a survey and compared also from other surveys like coming from United States and others, which states that basically energy efficiency and electricity expenses for every company is quite significant. There are researches which shows that around 10% of uh, companies uh, have the, uh, ha uh, have the uh, first uh, and most important expenses is like connected with the electro, uh, electro electricity bills and something around 25% it's like second and third biggest expenses. And the problem is that sometimes companies understand that there is some problem about that, but they actually don't act and uh, they think that they uh, need to do their own capex, capital expenditures, to uh, move things in bit a different order and they are not, uh, they don't know that there are uh, available other financing resources to, uh, as a support for their projects. We also did a business survey to show that and you can see uh, just two slides about this general information. You can see that uh, for those questions, for example, have you done control measurements of consumption in energy intensive equipment? Uh, more than 70%, namely 73% said no, which is not so good number. Uh, and we can also see in the next slide, um, have, uh, for those who have done something uh, have you been financing energy efficiency in which in which way? So almost uh, almost 100 percent, 91 percent basically did on their own. So what we saw that we understood that there are uh, some kind of uh, there are some kind of bound because those numbers, as sometimes perhaps companies understand that it should be done something, but they think that they need to spend their own money, that banks will not finance that, and that's exactly where Altum needs to act. We, we again found the market gap. We see that there is uh, something really where we could act, so basically support those green projects. So what we did during this year, we uh, designed a special program. This program was accepted in uh, 26 of September in the Cabinet of Ministers. Uh, any program of Altum is uh, accepted by the Cabinet of Ministers of Latvia, and we also in the same time got the finances throughout this green bond issuance. 
um, I guess some more slides why this energy efficiency is so um, important. You can see that, of course, inefficiency may arise starting from lightning till ventilation, air compression. I guess this is the audience which understands that. Um, and this is, I guess, also quite important. For example, when we talk about also some of those uh, projects, what we will support now, and actually starting from this month, we are supporting, like, uh, for example, very trivial example, by changing the, uh, changing the lightning from the usual one to the lead lightning. Uh, someone may just ask, said, uh, said that, uh, okay, I, just, I will change this lightning. What's, what's about that? So you can see those uh, three uh, sectors, like uh, for hotels, retail building, and warehouses, they form around 60% of all their uh, expenses for energo, uh, energo electricity. So we think that it's quite enough. So if you do, once you do those things, you make your uh, company more energo efficient, you can see you can spare a lot so we did our homework. We mm, uh, proposed a new solution. This is like green bonds, and it's a financial instrument for SMEs and large companies, projects that have uh, environmental and or climate benefits like energy efficiency, promotion of uh, renewable energy, and carbon reduction measures. So those are those things we, which we put. If you can show that your company can do something about those topics like an energy efficiency, then we can support you with a money. And that money we got from the green bond issuing. Currently, we issued 20 million euros, but we were very glad that uh, actually market um, basically demanded seven times more, almost 130 million euros. So we are able to make this program even uh, bigger, even larger, if we will see that there will be uh, enough interest. Currently, the first, uh, there are some, uh, some kind of first interest from the first companies, but we hope in a uh, couple of years we will just manage not only with this money, but also with the bigger numbers. And we will support with those 20 million euros in two different type of things, like business loans, like direct loans for the companies, for energy efficiency and ESCO loans. ESCO companies work like that, that basically those are like professionals, like operators who uh, got their own finances. They find those clients uh, and they try to show those clients that we can make your company uh, more energy efficient. We will do that on our own and then we will split this, uh, this money we will uh, spare. So this is in a simple matter, uh, the way how ESCO companies are working. You can see types of supported projects like energo for energy efficiency, also for renewable energy, sustainable transportation, and also for green buildings. So I guess we can basically cover, in, in very simple words, we can basically cover everything which is green and which company can provide to us. We will find a way how to uh, finance this project. Loan terms, and this is, I guess, the most important for those who are companies. They may say, okay, how this product, uh, for example, um, uh, is different for the thing which I can get from the bank or also from you, Altum, because we also provide our clients already now with some, uh, some different type of products, as I said, for loans or guarantees. And this is very important. So you can see those thresholds. We can give a direct loan for a company up to half a million euros. For the ESCO company, it means for professional uh, to 2.8 million euros and no additional collateral is required. So basically, company can come to us, show the project, show how much they will spare the money, and we will, uh, we will have those talks, and we can see that uh, loan repayment is ensured by extra cash flow from reduced energy bill. So you don't need no collateral, right? So this is very important for the company, so they can feel uh, easy, they can use their own money, their own capital expenditure, for other things to do, and uh, they will finance this project from this uh, um, just, uh, this energy efficiency from this reduced energy bill. We will uh, we also offering some uh, some accumulation with other state aid programs. 
uh, we can also give some holidays for those who started those projects. This is very attractive now uh, service we provide for those companies who would like to show that they have like green ideas. So YESCO, once again, if the company doesn't want to implement an ener energy efficiency project from its own borrowed funds, it may wish to apply for ESCO services instead. And how ESCO works, like Alton provides loan to the ESCO, uh, a special company which is professional in this field, then project is implemented by this ESCO company and this client uh, will uh, also have a contract signed between him and the ESCO company. What is good, the company does not have any additional costs, as I said, and payment is made from extra cash flow, as I said in previous slide. You can see like two already now like examples. One is uh, connected with Wu producing company. You can see that basically payback period is 4.5 uh, years. It's like not so um, huge. Uh, investment total uh, sum of the project was something around 27 uh, euros. This is also uh, interesting. This is another project which now deals with uh, lightning as a service uh, for one company, namely RCG Lighthouse. You can see that energy, energy saving by changing this lightning uh, uh, drop down to 68%. So. Uh, Actually, they shared this saving at the beginning uh, like 70 to 30 percent and then afterwards client gets everything. So it's very good to him not only after those five years but already basically from tomorrow when the project is implemented. We are still looking for the professional partners. Currently, we have like cooperation with those two. We are just uh, starting this program, as I said, from October. So Lightning Services with RCG Lighthouse, Energy Efficient technology, Technologies with AG Power. But we also try to promote this concept because those uh, companies who uh, have like knowledge in this field, who have some experience and also some, of course, extra funding may also uh, apply to us. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, the loudest uh, applause from our Estonian friends there. Eh? It says a lot, right? Well, uh, Renis, thank you very much. Uh, we will have, uh, please take your seat. Uh, we, I think there might be a bunch of questions coming your way, but uh, we have our, our next presenter um, um, waiting uh, on the line for a while already, so I want to include him. As, uh, as soon as possible. Uh, Milan, do you hear me? Milan, okay. Hello. You think, you think it's switched on? Milan, hello. 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 Hello, right. Um, sorry, this is uh, Eddie's from the conference. So, uh, you're on air uh, right now. I uh, apologize for uh, key, having kept you waiting for uh, for longer than necessary. But in any case, I, I I presume we're now okay, so we are ready to hear from you. So, uh, Milan, you Great. are uh, the Climate Savers Coordinator uh, for the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, so the floor is yours, please. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. It's, um, it's actually yeah. very good um, compared to the one of the earlier link-ups. Uh, sound is very, very okay. good. So we are ready to hear from you for up to 15 minutes. Great, great. Yeah, thank you, and uh, welcome from this present. Welcome to this presentation, and also uh, warm greetings from Mexico, as that's where I am based. Um, yeah. So in the coming 10 minutes, I will go through some of the work that W. BF is doing with its corporate partners. Um, as said before, my name is Milan Koiman. I work for uh, the WWF Swedish office, and I'm indeed involved in both the Climate Savers program and also the Science Based Targets Initiative, and both initiatives I will present to you shortly. Um, so the presentation today uh, consists of two parts. Firstly, I will show you uh, a little bit the big picture to which we operate, uh, meaning, for example, the science behind our work and also the urgent need uh, for change. And then the second part of the presentation is just showing various examples of how we work with companies um, in individual partnerships, but also uh, in broader programs. 
Um, so first of all, let me see if this works. Yes. Um, so as we all know, and probably you heard today, the climate is changing. We see more rainfall in places where there is already a lot of water. We see drier placing, drier places actually getting drier. Um, we also see increasing rates of ice melting. And we see that um, there are more extreme and also more frequent weather events. Um, we also see that this normally strikes already those livelihoods that um, are already affected most, and we also see more and more livelihoods being affected. Also, the ecosystems on which we so very much depend are more and more threatened through our direct actions and also, again, through the changing of the climate. So the need for mitigating these impacts and, again, building the resilience and also restoring resilience within them uh, should therefore be at the core of the work that we all do. So looking specifically at the business, also business is not immune to these changes. So for example, we can already think of regulatory changes that are happening. And the best example, as you probably heard many times today, is the Paris Agreement that came to, into effect in 2015. But for example, also take into account the increasing increases of prices, for example, due to the increased cost of fossil-based energy, and also the increasing pressure from external stakeholders or also internal stakeholders, um, uh, like also our organization, WWF. Um, we should also consider, for example, the physical risks that are also increasing. For example, the unpredictability of the severe weather events, which I just mentioned. As we have seen already in the past, that this has caused quite large-scale disruptions in the supply chain of uh, certain companies. And of course, this will only become worse if we don't address this and if we again build the resilience also within a company's system. And if this is not, let's say, problematic enough, we also see some mega trends, like still a rapid rise of the population. We will see a rapid growth of the economy and therefore also demand for products, services and materials. And again, we all have to do this whilst we have to significantly reduce our own footprint on this earth. So, shortly on the need for science-based targets, um, we luckily see that more and more governments and also actors such as companies are moving in the right direction. The best example, again, coming from the Paris Agreement, where we had many companies pledge to reduce their impact to a certain extent. However, as we can see on this slide, um, the red area shows that even with the current pledges that are made and also the contributions that were made, we are still on course to far exceed the two degree limit by 2100. So therefore what needs to happen is for governments to increase their ambition and also actors such as businesses to support this. And of course also you and I have to support this as well. So what are we actually expecting from companies? So simply put, a journey normally starts with knowing what your impact actually is. This means that companies have to start measuring their greenhouse gas emissions um, from their own operations, but as we see more and more importantly, it's also from the emissions that occur in the value chain of a company. Additionally, it is also important that a company discloses this information publicly. This can for example, be done through your website, but probably better if it is done via uh, organizations like the CDP, or formerly known their Carbon Disclosure Project. Of course, once you know your impact, we would like to see some action, uh, for example, in setting greenhouse gas reduction targets, um, and also in action plans to actually reduce your emissions or your impact. So we have seen with many companies that there is a lot of low-hanging fruit in terms of emission reductions that can be achieved with little investment and with um, immediate payback um, periods. Of course, the long-term decarbonization will take some more dedicated action and capacity, but also many companies, as we see now, are finding profitable ways to do so as well. 
And lastly, what we would like to see actually is that companies use their influence to um, influence other actors. So this could be companies that, uh, that are operating in the same sector, companies within your value chain, and also very importantly, policy makers, um, and again, also the customers. So you and I buying the products, or if it's a business to business, of course, other businesses that are buying your products. <coughs> Um, what we have seen also um, from companies that uh, have done this or that have started this journey and have started reducing their emissions, that uh, large cost savings can actually be achieved through, for example, energy efficiency measures and also through investing in renewable energy. And normally we've also seen that this leads to an increase in the competitiveness of the companies. Of course, the risks I already mentioned, and by addressing the impacts in your value chain, you're also reducing the risks, like the physical risks, like again, supply chain disruptions, but also regulatory risks and also brand risks. And of course, what we also see is setting ambitious target drives innovation and normally opens up new markets for the company to invest in because you're looking beyond sort of the established carbon intensive business models and looking at new opportunities to uh, grow your business. So um, now I would like to dive a little bit into the, the initiatives that we have and some of the partnerships to show you how we work with companies and also what some of the companies are doing. So first I would like to start with the Science-Based Targets Initiative. Uh, it was launched in 2014 and it includes the four organizations that you can see uh, on screen. The purpose of the initiative was to develop and support credible ways for companies to set targets in line with science, so in line with the two degree pathway and also now the 1.5 degree scenario. At the moment, uh, through various means, they are calling upon companies to sign up to the initiative to develop targets in line with science. And so far, more than 300 companies have actually pledged to do so. So one of the goals of the initiative as well is to make it the standard for the corporate sector so that every corporate, when they want to set science or emission reduction targets, they will be based on science. Um, also, the biggest benefit of um, science-based target is that it gives a clear benchmark to actually set the target against. So in the past, it was often hard to um, assess if a target was ambitious enough. And with this initiative, this makes it a lot easier. So a second initiative I want to highlight is actually the initiative I have been involved in most, which is the Climate Savers Program. Um, in this program, we work directly in partnerships with the companies that you see on screen. So there are a lot of quite a few American companies, but also Chinese, Japanese, European companies, so quite spread out over the world. And of course, with these partnerships, we are focusing on reducing the direct impact um, of these companies, but we also, again, try to use the companies or work with the companies to actually influence well beyond the operations um, of the companies themselves. So, for example, for many of these companies, most of the impact is within the value, change, uh, value chains. <laughs> Thus with, uh, for example, sourcing of raw materials um, or with the suppliers or also with the customers that are buying and using the products. So we therefore try to address these impacts, which implies also a strong collaboration between the parent company and, for example, the suppliers. And this is becoming more and more important to not only reduce the impact, but again also to reduce the risks, as I've shown you before. So. We also work with these companies um, in their respective sectors to again also influence the players there and to also make sure that they take ambitious steps um, in decarbonizing. So lastly, I want to show you two examples of uh, two partnerships we have. Both are actually also part of the climate, uh, of the, yeah, of the climate savers program. Um, so this is the partnership between WWF and H&M and also WWF and the Volvo Group. So first looking at H&M, um, so the part or the climate part of the partnership was launched in April of this year um, and they have committed to becoming climate positive throughout their entire value chain by 2040. So just to give you an idea what this means, 
um, they, so by 2040, they will have reduced or compensated all their emissions, um, not only in their own operations, but for example, also from the raw materials they source. So think, for example, about the cotton they use. Um, of course, also from their supplier, so the factory where they make their fabrics and also where they make their clothes, but also from their customers. So that's you and me that buy and wash and also throw away our clothes. So then I think it is important to consider that H&M, of course, only owns or really owns only a small part of um, the emissions, right? So that's mainly the stores they operate and also some warehouses. In all the other cases, they will have to work together with their suppliers to reduce the emissions. So again, with the raw material producers um, to, for example, change the agricultural practices, but also again with you and me that wash our clothes and to make sure that we wash from colder, colder temperatures or also use less deterrent um, for our uh, detergent, sorry, for our clothing. So here you get a feel for what it already takes for one company that really takes a very strong commitment to um, start decarbonizing their business. So the last example I want to give you is from the Volvo Group. And please mind that these are not the cars, but these are actually the trucks, the buses, and the heavy equipment, because the cars is actually a separate company um, in Chinese hands. Um, so Volvo also has taken on the, the ambition to significantly reduce part of their supply chain emissions by making their products more efficient. Um, of course, they also work to reduce the impact of their own operations and of their transportation, but compared to the, um, the bulk of the emissions, that's only a little part because, of course, most of the emissions occur in the use phase of their products, like driving a truck or a bus or using one of the heavy equipment. However, what's so important about this partnership is that Volvo is using this partnership to actually magnify their impact by working more directly with, for example, also the customers to um, operate the machinery more efficiently. But also, as you can see on the screen, um, they have a city mobility concept or city mobility challenge where they're actually looking at optimizing the public transport systems within several cities, which is, of course, very interesting and very much in line with what WWF would like to see as well. So this partnership is a good example of where Volvo uh, used the partnership with WWF to actually drive internal action, but also where they leverage the partnership to create positive impacts beyond their own operations. And that's exactly what we would like to see from companies. So this was uh, my brief presentation about the work that they do. I hope you uh, enjoyed it, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Milan, for uh, for that uh, link up from uh, from Mexico, right? Did I understand correctly? Yes, you're well, welcome. Well, thank you. Um, we will let you go now because we have uh, your colleague in in attendance yeah. here. So, uh, well, thank you very much. We'll we'll disconnect now. Uh, she will uh, take over from from there. Thank you very much. Great. So, yeah. thank you. Um, Eileen Collard, she's a co coordinator for Baltic Sea and Freshwater Program for the World uh, Wildlife Fund. Uh, 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 so, is there anything to add for more? Yes, go. Um, for more, is it is it working? Can you? No. One, two, three. One, six. Two, three four, six, no. Oh yes, oh, wow. right. So. We don't have a lot of time left, uh, I'm sorry to say that, but uh, is there any, you know, more regional uh, examples that can be used to sort of uh, illustrate uh, the case that Milan was making as well, please? Uh, what we do in, in Latvia and in some other Baltic countries as uh, well is a uh, green office movement. As uh, Rain is uh, told before, uh, let's say 30% of lighting in, uh, of electricity uh, in offices uh, is for lighting. Uh, so we are working with offices, so it doesn't necessarily mean that in the end the company um, has a different or, uh, or different product or different service, but we focus on their work in their offices, what they do there, and uh, we help them to uh, save energy, to save water, or to produce less waste. And what we have discovered uh, when we discuss with companies 
the, the option of, of joining this uh, green office movement, uh, they don't really about they don't really care about the money, because yeah, if you want we can pay something just just leave us. The thing is, they are worried about the fact that they will actually have to do something and they will have to work on this issue. So it's not about money. And as we can see already in the world, money and environment, those are not two opposite things. You know what I do in the mornings before breakfast? I uh, check stock markets, of course. It's, it's really funny. It's uh, colorful graphs and so on. And uh, sometimes you have a feeling that they are very fragile. For example, in the night, uh, Justin Bieber tweets that he was in McDonald's and drank Coca-Cola, and the prices of Coca-Cola go up. Or uh, it is announced that uh, Steven Seagal will uh, be starring the next Netflix movie, and Netflix shares go down to 10%. So a couple of months ago, uh, Mr. Donald Trump uh, announced that US is quitting Paris Agreement. It sounds like a big decision, you know. And I was thinking that, hmm, what might it affect? Uh, for sure, uh, Tesla will go down because it means that they will uh, probably not earn so much in, in the future. Or fossil fuel companies might go up because they see that, haha, we will have some more time for, uh, to earn some money. And I wake up in the morning, first thing I do, I check the stock markets. And you know what? Nothing happened. He announced this big thing, we are quitting, and no one cares. And uh, I followed this for the next week, and nothing was changing except these big companies uh, were opposing him and saying, hey, no, 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 no. We want to continue, we want to stick to Paris Agreement, and we will do it. And when I say big companies, I don't mean... Um, what might be the environmental friendly company of theirs, number one, I don't know. I mean big companies like Apple, big companies like Intel, uh, Schneider, Unilever, uh, British Petroleum, yes, British Petroleum are the good guys now. They all said, no, thank you, Donald Trump. We want to continue uh, to uh, switch to renewable sources. And this means that uh, it is not only a hobby of some crazy hippies, it is how people are going to earn money in the future, and the future starts now. Okay, that, 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 that works as a concluding statement uh, pretty well, because we're, we're out of time. Uh, I think uh, what you wanted to say is basically um, reflects a couple of things that were discussed at the beginning of the conference as well, that uh, we're, you know, we have achieved a moment where the economic model and our understanding of how the future economy will work is already self-sustainable uh, without necessarily needing, uh, you know, political... Uh, well, the political side is important as well, but it's not, you know, 100% uh, uh, dependent on what the political leaders would say. There's a sort of self-sustaining movement in that direction. So I, I wanted to uh, give the last, uh, you know, uh, sentences to, to Reynes there. I didn't have the opportunity to, uh, to involve you. We just have a couple of minutes left. Um, so uh, the green bonds, in your... Um, in your perspective and your uh, experience with the uh, w w with the thing that you're doing uh, in Altum, you think so? It's energy uh, efficiency projects. Do you think you can amplify this uh, in terms of where to go on? You know, so side project. What can grow out of this in other sort of where where can you uh, deploy other green bonds or stuff? You, you, do you have so any ideas of how this? Could grow. Uh, yeah, we think that uh, I also showed you one uh, slide where there was like basic numbers about Altum, like we have 210 million euros in credits and then their guarantees and so on, those total assets. So comparing this program, it's currently honestly saying like peanuts, but it's like a pilot project. What we see already now, there's a couple of interest from serious guys who have some of those projects I showed. We would like to see that in a two years term, uh, this, this, this will like um, become something bigger because it's 
nowadays it's as also Elin said for for some perhaps don't care but there are more and more also from the business guys who th understands the benefit of that and not only something uh, which is connected about you know supporting green idea as it is like when you show those numbers they understand that actually it's good for them also from the financial point of view and what we will do we will continue with this program and um, if I may say some predictions, I see that there will be at least two or three times uh, lower in amounts in upcoming, I don't know, five, seven years. And we will see a lot of those projects and only like those pilot projects. And we see we will do a good job there. Those will be like, you know, um, more usual now. And then also the credit institutions like the banks will more finance that. And so we will, we will do our job to push this industry and we will, with the, with the concrete, particular practical instruments all right so the last words to you mart i'm afraid i will ask you a um, difficult question i don't know whether you'll be able to answer that so those initiatives that uh, were discussed there by Reynes, by alien by 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 milan as well so towards the meeting of the targets reduction targets how important are those are those just mar is this just marginal stuff or it could in time actually uh, bring about you know very significant chunks of those reductions that need to be made coming from the business and entrepreneurial sector right away, not from the government so much. I, I, I really think that this is a key and I really admire what you're doing with the green bond system because uh, I'm not an expert on this field but uh, from this presentation that is why I was clapping so hard that I, I like the approach uh, because I think that getting financing there it's in increasingly important because uh, there isn't any you know cheap money you need to have uh, you need to use this money what you have what you have um, most efficiently and i think that uh, that not just providing grants but but providing uh, other finan financial uh, instruments is is a key and uh, and uh, moving forward, I, I have a same problem in my home country that uh, it seems to me that our credex is not so, let's say, environmentally oriented. And, uh, and I, I think what, may, what, what in, a, in a large scale could be an important sector which needs to be penetrated is transportation. And there needs to be, when we are talking now about, uh, let's say, uh, energy efficiency, we need to more and more get into transportation because this is uh, on a let's say on a even on a global scale this is a huge unknown what to do with the transportation yeah. sector and and we need to we need to think about solutions uh, uh, financial instruments and incentives how to move the enterprises into using uh, low uh, low carbon uh, so, yeah. so to conclude, in overall, this sounds quite optimistic because I was still getting in the earlier conferences and I was still getting questions about which area to subsidize. And, and, but no, this is becoming self-sustainable in terms of business models and, uh, and, and, and a lot of those industries have taken off on, the, on their own. So great. Thank you very much. We're out of time. Uh, let's give a good round of applause to our um, participants here. Okay. Thank you.